Hey everybody, welcome back to another week of film history. This week we have the French New Wave, which is probably personally my favorite um, period of film history. Uh, we move kind of quickly throughout the semester so we can get to these more contemporary movements. Um, but it's a period in the late 1950s and early 1960s that really sort of challenged the form of uh, film convention. So we should have a fairly good idea of what the classical Hollywood style is. I know we've taken a bit of a turn um, from there looking at some more international films that do things a little bit differently. So we saw um, Italian neorealism that used um, some non-actors, and we saw also Japanese cinema that used handheld camera and natural lighting. These things are not uh, what we would think of when we think of um, conventional, um, classical Hollywood style. Instead, if you think about um, what we looked at with uh, The Wizard of Oz and what we looked at with Gone with the Wind, um, that sort of style stuck around for decades after the 1930s. Um, so we have a very conventional way of cutting a scene and a very conventional way of editing a scene. And we also have a very conventional way that performers perform uh, in film. Um, so if we think about how a film is edited, um, generally you have an establishing shot. So an establishing shot just means that um, that you see the scene, you see the area that the performers will be performing in uh, as probably like a wide shot or a long shot, right? So we establish the area where the action is going to take place, and then we see maybe like a dialogue scene cut um, in a very specific way, right? We have a wide shot so we can see the uh, entirety of the action taking place. So if there's um, any action that happens, even if the action is as simple as a character walks from one place to another, uh, we have uh, close-ups uh, of each of the characters. Uh, and we may also have like a medium close-up instead of just like a conventional close-up. And how we cut between these shots um, is entirely dependent on continuity. So if you remember uh, back with the um, Soviet montage theory, montage is discontinuous edits, right? So um, we don't see one thing bleed into another. We don't expect the action um, from one shot to carry over into the next shot as though everything is playing out in real time. Uh, but in the conventional um, classic Hollywood style, uh, we would. We would expect that with almost all of the time. It's somewhat rare to see a montage in these films. Instead, we see all continuity editing. A house with a picket fence and a barn with a weather vane and a, uh, of a, of a running horse. <laughs> That's our farm. So also in the uh, classic Hollywood style, we see a very specific type of cinematography. Um, again, you have your wide shot, you have your establishing shots, uh, but also any stars would have a close-up, and everything would be lit a particular kind of way. Now, there's always um, exceptions to these rules, uh, like what we saw with Citizen Kane. We see some discontinuous edits. We see some transitions that um, are a little bit different. Classic Hollywood style, you have cuts, you have dissolves, you have fades, that's it. So remember, a dissolve is fading from one shot to another, a fade is fading to black or up from black, and then a cut is just cutting from one shot to another. But we didn't really see like anything um, drastically different, um, and it, honestly, it's a little bit like um, creatively stifled from what we even saw in the silent film era. So in the silent film era, we have lots of experimentation. Remember, uh, Lois Weber has um, some really interesting uh, cinematography angles, and it's cut, interestingly, uh, with those um, shots uh, 
kind of superimposed on top of each other, those things you don't really see in uh, classical Hollywood style. And for, you know, three decades, it didn't really change too much. Um, there was some exceptions to those rules, um, namely Orson Welles and... Um, uh, even Alfred Hitchcock did some interesting things, and those uh, directors would actually become um, kind of glorified in the eyes of the French New Wave. Um, so those those filmmakers were um, uh, elevated, uh, put on a pedestal because of their their willingness to experiment and do things a little bit differently. And in fact, um, without the French New Wave. I don't know that we would give them as much credit as the driving creative force behind the films. So in the Hollywood system, the studios really dictated how a movie was produced. Um, there were directors there, but the directors, um, all a director does is work with the actors on performance. Um, again, you know, Orson Welles had a huge amount of creative freedom making his films, but that was um, not the norm as we saw. Um, so... Um, the idea that the director is uh, that main creative force all comes from the French New Wave, an auteur theory. So there's a uh, precursor to auteur theory called La Camera Stylo, um, which literally means camera pen. So the camera works as the author's pen pen or like the painter's brush. So this comes from a manifesto in 1948 predicting that film uh, was going to be uh, a new means of artistic expression for singular artists, right? So uh, technology is getting a little bit better or more um, accessible by regular people. You can now have cameras that you can just kind of put over your shoulder rather than cameras that are the size of a room. Um, uh, and we see like documentary films being created uh, by a limited crew and not big production companies. Um, so um, the, this manifesto in 1948 sort of predicts that um, there's going to be a new movement in film and artists are going to be elevated um, and be able to access film as a means of artistic expression. Now, uh, from this manifesto, there are several film critics that start to kind of go against the grain of conventional film. Uh, Francois Truffaut calls it cinema du papa, uh, which literally means uh, daddy's cinema. And the idea here is that all those conventions that we're seeing uh, with the classical Hollywood style, that's that's over in France too. So um, there, there's a classical French style that's all like literary adaptations. And Francois Truffaut, one of these film critics, is highly critical of this style. Instead calling for um, uh, mass change in the way that films are produced uh, by artists. Avant de vous connaître tous les deux, je ne riais jamais. Je faisais des têtes comme ça. Mais c'est fini, plus jamais ça. Maintenant, c'est comme ça. So from this the idea of auteur theory develops. The idea that the director is the author, auteur literally means author, of the film. Um, so if you've ever thought about like who's the most important person um, in the production of a film and you think it's the film's director, that comes from this. So there were quite a few of these um, French film critics that decided that they should uh, become um, these auteur directors, um, and they did influence the movement, but we're really going to look at two that I think are most important, um, and that is Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard. Both of these filmmakers had uh, two films that would kind of elevate the French New Wave in um, international audiences' eyes. And Francois Truffaut had a film in 1959 called The 400 Blows, and Jean-Luc Godard had a film called 
Breathless in 1960. And you'll have the option to watch either of these two to get a good feel for what the French New Wave did and how it did it differently. So as you're watching these films, uh, you may notice that some of the things that I'm pointing out don't seem all that unconventional. Uh, but it's important that you look at this stuff through a historical context. So if you compare a French New Wave film, if you watch the 400 blows and you compare that to the Wizard of Oz you're going to notice quite a few differences uh, in terms of their overall style in terms of their cinematography in terms of their editing uh, in terms of their performance as well um, but if you compare the 400 blows to something uh, more uh, modern or contemporary, so if you compare it to a film by, say, Quentin Tarantino, you're more likely to see a lot of similarities there. And likewise, a Quentin Tarantino movie won't look much like uh, The Wizard of Oz. So after the 1960s, the French New Wave really broke through um, to international audiences, and that included American filmmakers that would later adapt some of their style um, to fit this new sort of editing style and cinematography style. So as you're watching these films, I think it's fun to kind of look out for the things that are so different, um, and I'll kind of point you in the direction of some things that you might find. Now, it really depends on which of the two films you watch either The 400 Blows or Breathless. Breathless is highly unconventional, whereas The 400 Blows, several of the unconventional aspects seem much more conventional for um, contemporary film. So Jean-Luc Godard and Breathless are doing things that certainly uh, uh, didn't translate to um, contemporary film. Several things that did, but a lot of things that also did not. Um, so it's very easy to see some of the things that uh, Godard is experimenting with, especially in terms of editing uh, in his film. So let's talk about those editing differences. Um, you're gonna see discontinuous edits. So essentially something very close to a montage, but you're gonna see it in a different sort of way. You can see jump cuts through dialogue scenes in Breathless. Hélas, hélas, hélas. J'aime une fille qui a une très jolie nuque, de très jolis seins, une très jolie voix, de très jolis poignets. A très joli front, de très joli genou. Godard will use jump cuts to just kind of move the pace forward quicker. So we don't need to we don't need to have long periods of quiet. Instead, let's just kind of cut to make the pace move faster. You'd certainly see the cuts that way. That's again, you know, not what classical Hollywood style would want. They would want things to be invisible. Um, you're going to see those cuts for sure in Godard's film, um, but he didn't care about that. In fact. Uh, all of his jump cuts in this film weren't exactly intentional. Uh, he shot Breathless. Breathless seemed too long to his friends, um, and they suggested cutting things down. And then he just took an unconventional route to cut things down, rather than cut out scenes or uh, cut down scenes using continuity editing. He decided, I can just use jump cuts. Uh, you'll also notice some rapid editing in, um, in the French New Wave so much quicker cuts and it may not seem like super rapid if you've seen maybe like whiplash like a contemporary film with very quick cuts at times so as an example in a classic hollywood um, style edit you would expect to see a character arrive at um, a location so you'll have that establishing shot the character arrives and then if um, that character needs to walk to a door and knock on the door and then someone answers the door and then they have a conversation there all of that stuff needs to play out in continuity so we're taking a whole lot of time for something that you know the French New Wave would perceive as non-important information right um, especially if that location doesn't become like a uh, a staple location you still need it according to the classical Hollywood style because we wouldn't understand where we are um, like it doesn't give audiences the credit of like uh, being able to comprehend 
um, uh, a change in location without seeing that change in location. But the French New Wave said, um, let's just show the show the building and then just jump right to that door. Oh là là, Michel. Tu peux entrer? Oui. Um, so lots of um, experimentation with the form, and it's not really things that we haven't seen before, but it's things that we haven't seen in a long time, uh, kind of challenging uh, the set standard way of doing things. So uh, we we have seen decade after decade these radical changes, but by the time we hit the 1930s, everything sort of stagnates, and it's the French New Wave that really forces it uh, to, to sort of uh, make a change. Beyond editing, we also see cinematography changes. We'll see some long takes, so that's kind of a cinematography and editing change. Like maybe there was a long take, but we would expect to uh, cut from one shot to another. Uh, but uh, where you're really going to notice these long takes are with um, moving shots and tracking shots. We'll also see playful performances. Again, we see play throughout the French New Wave and all these production areas, but performances, you'll probably notice it more than anywhere else. Um, so it's not that general melodramatic style that we've seen um, so often in earlier film history. Instead, it's almost as though the actors... Um, understand that they're in a movie, like the characters are sort of self-aware that they're in a movie. In fact, sometimes there are even like references to this. You may also notice characters um, often break the fourth wall, uh, which just means that a character maybe like looks into the camera lens, like uh, sort of um, identifying that they understand that they're within a movie. Um, uh, it could mean that they directly address the audience or directly address the viewer. Um, that stuff happens in these films, and it's very, very different uh, for audiences at the time. But it's not so different for us now. Um, so this is one of the things that kind of became normalized from the French New Wave. Um, so if you've ever seen like the movie Deadpool before, where Deadpool turns to the camera and talks to us as the audience, that's breaking the fourth wall. Oh! Oh, hello! If you've ever seen even uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off in the 1980s, when Ferris Bueller talks to us about his um, his ways of getting out of going to school, um, that is also breaking the fourth wall. So it's much more conventional now, but for audiences at the time, they'd never really seen anything like that before. Um, but that's all um, the intent of these filmmakers, is to really challenge that form, challenge uh, what has become convention for decades now. And you'll see this, this kind of influence, not just in Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Deadpool, but across the board, starting in the 1960s, when uh, like Jean-Luc Godard was highly coveted to come to the United States and direct like a Hollywood film and use that French New Wave style. You're going to see um, from the 1960s and 70s and onward, um, a lot of these conventions that are uh, developed at, at this moment become the new conventions of the new Hollywood and the new independent film. <laughs> 
If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. So personally, I think that this is a landmark moment in film history. It is a pivot point um, from um, a, a certain way of doing things. So without this, I'm not sure that, um, that, that film would look the way it does today. Now you can say that about all of the film movements that we've seen um kind of throughout film history, but I don't think at any point so much has changed so quickly in terms of artistic style. So let's look at one of two of these films, either The 400 Blows or Breathless. Um, remember, with your blogs at this point in the semester, you only have to choose one of two subjects. So if you already covered Japanese cinema, you don't have to cover uh, the French New Wave or either of these two films in your blog this week. You pick one or the other. Um, preferably, you watch both and you decide um, which one works a little bit better for you or which one you're a little bit more interested in. If you choose the 400 blows, you're going to have to look pretty closely for the differences uh, between those films and uh, more conventional narratives from the uh, classical Hollywood style. Uh, if you choose Breathless, it's going to be... Um, very evident the differences um, that that he employs, but some things may seem a little bit more conventional, like the Godard often like tracks from in front of his subjects from a low angle, and we see that all the time in film, and it's sort of like Godard's um, one of Godard's signatures. Remember the camera stylo working as uh, the author's pen. You'll see um, very specific styles for specific directors and it's somewhat hard to see that stuff unless you look at multiple films from the same director so that's what i would like for you to do in terms of your research what is the signature style of these auteur directors. So if you watch The 400 Blows, look for things that are conventions of Francois Truffaut. And if you watch Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, look for things that are uh, conventions of Jean-Luc Godard. I highly recommend, rather than just reading about the styles, which uh, can kind of give you a little bit of information about what they do specifically in their films, film to film, uh, you watch some things. So um, video essays are great uh, for French New Wave stuff. It will show you cuts that are interesting. Like if you try to write out how a cut is done, it takes a whole lot more words than um, just watching it play out on the screen. So uh, take a look at some of their uh, earlier and later works and try to establish what is their style as a filmmaker and how does that apply to either the 400 Blows or Breathless with your blog entries. Now again, you don't have to do this one if you're going to do Japanese cinema. Either one's just fine by me, but either one is also due next week by the time we get to um, by the time we get to our next subject. So don't forget if you're watching this on the day of the video being published uh, on Blackboard, uh, you have a thesis statement due today. Um, so make sure that you turn that in by midnight. And if you're watching this a little bit later and forgot about the thesis statement, unfortunately, you are late at this point. So hopefully you did that and feel good about it. Again, if you have questions about things, feel free to email me. I should be around uh, to answer any questions you might have. Um, all right. So I will talk to you all next week with another film history lesson.